Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you. Mighty God, Heavenly Father, we exalt you. We exalt the name that is above every name today, the name of Jesus, the one who died on that cross for our sins and rose from the dead. We exalt you, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you, Lord God, for everything you've done for us and the things you're going to do. Lord, you have great plans for your people. Lord, here in this time and in the age to come, Lord, you have great things for us. And we thank you, Lord, that there is not just hope, but God, there is excitement and joy and just amazing things we know that are ahead. We don't want to miss them for anything, Lord. We're going to lay down every weight, every sin, every compromise, every bit of lukewarmness, every distraction. Lay it aside and let you wash our sins away. So we can walk with you. I walk with you in newness of life. Walk with you in holiness and obedience. To walk with you being led by your spirit. That's what we want, Lord. So help us today, Lord. I ask you to move through this time. Speak through me today, Lord, as we get into your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Welcome, everyone. Fire and Grace Church. Those of you out there watching and listening from all over the place. Denmark, Soren. You know, I want to say thank you to, to Soren in Denmark for doing the Dean Odell Europe page. I noticed last night, I do look at the comments. I can't comment because you won't know it's me because YouTube won't let me have a an actual account with them anymore, but I do see the the comments and I appreciate and I saw where the the old Europe page is up to almost ten thousand subscribers and that's pretty amazing. So uh he has to edit me quite a bit to keep that up in Europe. But uh <laughs> But that's okay. Uh, as long as they get some of it, they can get the unedited version at our website. Um, I've entitled this today. We're going to get into the word. We've got a lot of scriptures we're going to cover today. I've entitled this today, Hatching Snake Eggs. And it's something I want to tell you right now. We're going to show you in the word. You don't want to be doing. That's actually a baby cobra coming out of that thing right there. Why anybody, I started looking this up, and there's people out there that, are, that raise baby cobras. Something is not right up here with that whole concept right there, right? And uh, anyway, I want everybody to take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah 59 is where we're going to start. And we're going to start at verse 1 there. And if you're wondering what this means, you're going to see that this sermon today, this message today is about... Lying. It's about lying. It's about slander. It's about bearing false witness. And this is something I think the body of Christ does not take seriously enough as a serious sin that you are going to be held accountable for. And uh, I think there's just two mouths wag too easy these days against your brother, your sister, your leadership, it's just there's too many lies, slanderous words said. And I just want to say something at the outset of this, we get into this today. Really be careful when you say thing, something about someone else, unless you absolutely know, positively know, that it is true. Because you don't want to be a liar. You don't want to be bearing false witness. You don't want to be hatching snake eggs. I'm going to show you. The Bible says this. It's like hatching snake eggs when you do these things. All right, let's read this. Isaiah 59, verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now, you don't want that in your life. 
And he's telling you the problem. The problem always comes back to one thing. It comes back to if we're, if we're feeling separated from God, we feel like he's not blessing us. Or Now, yes, we can walk through seasons of trial. And it doesn't mean that we've sinned. But a lot of times it is because we've sinned. And listen, a lot of our sins come straight out of our mouth. All right? Now, and, and the Lord, <laughs> he is, uh, this is a big deal to him. Okay? But he says, he goes on to say, he tells them, he said, for your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Why? Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. Things that are twisted, they're not exactly right. That's what perverseness is. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice eggs. That there is a viper, a poisonous snake. They hatch these eggs, these snake eggs, and weave the spider's web. He that eateth their eggs dieth. And that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Now we're going to stop there for just a second. And I want you to put up the definition, this word cockatrice. It's only in the Bible like three times, I think. But it's an important, the definition kind of gives you a, a little understanding of it. It's uh, either sepa or sepa here is the Hebrew word, the outline of biblical usage, meaning they've taken from all the lexicons to basically get you a definition. But poisonous serpent, a viper snake or adder, the Strong's definition of this word for cockatrice means to extrude. What is to extrude? It means something that goes, what, out, right? So it's alluding to the viper as it's thrusting out its tongue and hissing, using its tongue. So what he's talking about here in the context of this, he's saying that if you speak lies, deceit, falsehoods that literally you are like the mouth of the serpent the serpent's tongue is coming out of you you're just like the hissing of a serpent and you're a serpent also that's multiplying because you're laying you're laying eggs to be hatched out and make more little serpents and that's why he says he says you're basically just spreading demonic stuff and really helping the kingdom of darkness because remember in the book of revelation satan is called the accuser of the brethren right and this is a very important issue see i i and the reason i'm bringing this up to is because i i sat down one day you know i i've, I've heard greg Locke's latest rant basically at me throwing me under the bus with everybody else that's into biblical cosmology AK flat earth now he sent me an apology and the reason I didn't make a big deal out of the apology is because I believe the apology was not real and it wasn't because the things he apologized for which I have the text messages to prove it the things he apologized for he went on a podcast the other day and said the same lies that he put out on that press release right after the uh the debate. And I sent him a personal text yesterday, a very long one. Because what he's doing is telling lies. And the things that whole press release was a lie. And then, you know, he, I have the text message where I asked him, I said, you should have taken that down. And he had his staff take it down. Now, why would you take down a press release if you thought it was true? So if you took it down, you thought it was incorrect. But then you're going to go on a podcast with 500,000 subscribers and basically pour out the same poison. And I told him, I said, you are, a, you are a liar and a slanderer. And I said, I hope you repent before the Lord brings his discipline upon you. Because you don't get to lie about another fellow minister and get away with it. I'm sorry. You don't get to slander and, and, and put things in ways where you are trying to hurt their character and their, uh, their reputation. It's slander. But see, here's the thing. 
And this is something that we all need to work on to make sure that we're not doing this to each other. You know, there were people after the debate, you know, Pastor Greg was pretty nasty. Anybody that watches the debate from beginning to end knows who was nasty and who wasn't. Okay? And then he tried to act like two. He tried to act like I threw the mic at him. I said, buddy, I, this, I put this in the, te in the text yesterday. I said, I was a quarterback from Pee Wee to college. If I was throwing the mic at you, it would have hit you between the eyes. I said, that is ridiculous. You know I wasn't throwing it at you. I said, that's dishonest. And he still, he still let that go out there. And I'm like, wow, how can you be a Christian, a man of God, and just lie and slander and misrepresent somebody so blatantly and do it so publicly? I'm telling you, if he doesn't repent, it's all coming down. It's all coming down. And it's not just him, though. I got people out there, because you remember our Skyfall shirts this year? Our Skyfall that had the dome, which is the firmament, right? We had the Polaris and we had the pillars. It's setting upon the pillars, just like the Bible says. Somebody posted something where because of the pillars, the two pillars there, that we're Freemasons because the, pillar, the Freemasons have two pillars. And I was like, really? But, and, and it's probably Russian vids because he's just got, he, he's got this, uh, he's got just a, everybody, everybody but him, I guess, is a Freemason or part of the cabal or something. Um, but he's a clickbait. It's all about clickbait and views for him. But let me just tell you right now, Russian vids. The people you keep slandering and telling lies about, you are not going to get away with it. See, liars are going to be in big trouble. Let's, let's read a few more verses about this. We're going to go over to the New Testament for a second. And let's go to Revelation 21 first. And this is why I'm making a big deal about this. Because lately, too, we've had Pastor Mike Signorelli with Dr. Michael Brown. We've had this uh, cessationist guy. What's his name? Justin Peters. Um, we've had Ray Comfort. Who else? Um, am I forgetting? I'm forgetting somebody. Has really come out hard against biblical creation that we teach and believe. And it's funny, I watched this Justin Peters little video the other day, and, you know, Rob Skiba and I disagreed on many things, but Rob did some neat experiments where he did the, you know, the sun on a flat table and going down and using... Uh, the, the, the atmosphere, recreating the atmosphere and, and the moisture in the air and things. And Rob did some, some really great experiments. Well, he debunked the idea because Justin Peter said, well, because there's the, the sun reflects under the clouds sometimes, that means the earth has to be round because the sun is going around, you know, we're going around, it's, it's going that way, and that's why. Uh, but Rob showed seven years ago, debunked that nonsense, when he showed a cloud and as the sun, his sun moved away, how the light went underneath it. I mean, it's an easy little experiment to do to prove that, yes, it's possible on a flat plane to have the sun at a distance lighting up things under the clouds. That's why the shadows get really long. It's not complicated, Justin. But here the thing is, this guy's supposed to be, Justin Peters is supposed to be this apologist. He's supposed to be this, you know, wolf hunter. He's supposed to be this guy that gives us the truth, you know, right? He's out there doing all these videos about people. And yet he tries to debunk the whole flat earth biblical cosmology thing and uses no scripture whatsoever. None in his video, not one. And then Greg has the audacity on that uh podcast the other day to act like he's the one that gave scripture during the debate that is a misrepresentation and dishonest people counted it up 
He gave about six scriptures and I was over 40. Plus, I didn't just give scriptures, over 40 scriptures, but I broke down the words in the scriptures, the Hebrew and Greek definitions of those words, which he did none of and actually did wrong, and I had to correct him about it. But yet he puts out like he was the biblical scholar there that night, and I was, I was putting out nonsense. I'm going to tell you right now, this issue of biblical cosmology the truth of what the Bible says about creation is a big deal. And you're really picking sides by, by deciding that you're going to come out and fight it and mock it and say that the Bible's oh, about all the descriptors of creation. It's just poetry. It's just figurative language. Every bit, you th really, what they're saying, I, I heard Dr. Michael Brown say this, that basically all the stuff, unless it agrees with NASA and the heliocentric model, all of it's just poetry. All of it's just figurative language. And I'm like, wow. And then they sit there and laugh, ha, 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 like it's all funny. I'm going to tell you what happens when you depart from the truth of Scripture, and I don't care what truth it is, and you start mocking it, the Holy Spirit departs from you. The anointing leaves you. And it's going to happen to some of these people because it, what they're doing, it's not just like they disagree. They have decided to attack and mock and ridicule what's clearly in the Bible. And you know what? It's not just this subject. It's the, uh, the gift of tongues. It's the gifts of, of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of healing and working of miracles, casting out demons. we got people out there mocking, Christians mocking other Christians about believing in casting out demons. And yet it's throughout the, the New Testament that both Jesus and his followers cast out demons. It should be normal, but they mock and ridicule that. And I'm just here to announce today that all of this slander and ridicule and especially coming from a place that is lies, it's just complete lies. I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, if you say the Bible says that we live on a sphere spinning and flying through an ever expanding universe, that's not in the Bible. So if you're saying that, then you are a liar. Plain and simple, you are preaching and teaching lies. Y'all can say what you want about us biblical cosmology people. We stick to the word on the subject. I wrote a 479-page book going through the scriptures on everything from the firmament to the shape of the earth to the nature of the sun, moon, and stars from the scriptures. No one, no one can tell me it's not biblical. When you write a book, you're basically sitting down to write years of research, and then I spent hours upon hours researching again and reconfirming and, and my sources on everything. I know what the firmament is from Genesis to Revelation. And if you try to say it's just an empty expanse of outer space when the Bible clearly says, no, it's a molten glass crystal dome over the earth upon which God's throne sits. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what the ancient Hebrews believed. But somehow, we are smarter than Moses today. We're smarter than Joshua. Joshua didn't know what he was talking about when he told the sun and, and moon to stand still, and they did. I, you know, it's amazing to me. These guys know more than the man that was up in the mountain in the glory of God, talking to God face to face. Isn't that something? And they, they have the audacity to say that God didn't mean when he said to Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Oh, there's no real foundations. That's just figurative. That's what Dr. Michael Brown said. There's no real pillars of creation. No, that's just figurative. God said there were pillars. God said there was a foundation to Job. Why would God use figurative language when he's talking directly to Job about creation? 
Job just, oh, he just wouldn't be able to get it. Dr. Michael Brown even went so far as to say that the Bible does not, the Bible does not have scientific information in it about anything. We shouldn't look at it about that for anything. I'm like, my God, you sound like one of these liberal scholars. And he's supposed to be a Holy Spirit-filled leader in the church world. And it's embarrassing. In fact, it's sickening. I used to have some respect for the man, but I have lost all of it now. You know, I contacted him years ago when I was writing um, The Polluted Church. I contacted him years ago and showed him where Mike Bickle was teaching false doctrine and occult mysticism and Roman Catholic mysticism and how there was all kind of sexual demons involved with Bob Jones and all and Paul Cain and all of that and how it was going to be a disaster. In 2010, 11, Dr. Michael Brown and I, I was emailing back and forth. He said he would read my book. When he found out I was naming names, oh, mm, 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 Mike Bickle's my friend. He ignored it. He ignored it, the warning that God gave me to give to the body of Christ about IHOP and Mike Bickle. And look at what has happened now. We have found out that it has been going on for over 20 years that Mike Bickle's been using his position as a spiritual leader and as a prophet and using his so-called prophetic gifts to have relationships with women, some 14 years old and much younger than him. The question now is, is he going to go to jail? How much could have been stopped had Dr. Brown gone to his friend and said, this is what's going on. You guys better get a handle on this. Back in 2010 and 11, uh-uh, but he wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole because Mike Bickle was his friend. This is the kind of crap that goes on. And I'm going to tell you right now, I, I, I lost respect then because I, I trust. Here's, a, here's another thing. If you give your word about something, you best do it. I mean, unless just something comes in and you just can't. You know, there's just no way you can't. Then you go to the person and you say, look, I know I said I would do this, but this is what's happened and I just can't. But other than that, you better keep your word. Because let me tell you something. If you say you're going to do something and you don't do it, you're a liar. You just told a lie. And God wants His people to be about the truth in everything. How many young women would not have been abused over the last 20 years? Or how long has it been since I wrote it? What, what 12 years? Had there been some intervention back then, See, I knew then that just about the entire so-called prayer movement, prophetic movement within the charismatic church has been corrupt sexually, doctrinally, and, and occult, in, in occult pollution. I have known this for years and years. You know, in 1995, when uh, God had me start the, the church I started in Montgomery, he spoke to me these words and said, the charismatic movement is over. I mean, he spoke it to me strong. It has been nothing but a shell of a so-called church slash movement slash whatever you want to call it. It's over. It's, I don't blame some of these guys like Justin Peters and some of these people that are cessationist and anti-everything charismatic because most of it, I agree with them, has gone into kookyville. It has gone into error. It has gone into counterfeits and extremes. It is demonic and it is riddled. That entire movement is riddled with sexual immorality. And they hide it and lie about it all the time. I remember going into some big charismatic church. I won't even name names. And the moment I got around the praise and worship leader, 99% of them are homosexual. And if they're not, they're in sexual sin with somebody on the praise and worship team. It's like a meat market, like a dating service or something. It's insane, y'all. 
And then they get up there and lead us in worship. No. I think about Brian Houston lying, covering up for his pedophile father for years, which allowed his pedophile father to continue to be a pedophile and molest kids. And then a pastor, a Hillsong, biggest church in Australia. Then he lies about it to the authorities. He lies about it to the church until it all comes out. And you know, here's the thing about truth. It's always going to come out. Oh, it may take 20 years. It may take 30 years. It may take 40 years. It's going to come out. The skeletons are going to come out. That's why as the people of God, you have to be about telling the truth, living the truth, being real, not hiding anything. Because it will come out. And this is why, again, God is serious about lying. I told you to turn to Revelation 21. Go down to verse 6. We'll read 6 through 8. I've read this many times in this church. I'm going to read it again. This is a, a warning to these lying preachers out here and these lying prophets. These people that, that get up and lie about healings or miracles in their services. That search on the internet and get information about you and then act like it's a prophetic word. Oh, and many of them are doing that right now. It's so easy. I get your name. When you come into church, somebody gets your name from me, I can look up your Instagram, your Facebook, and then I can go, hey, don't, does this number mean anything to you? And, and give your address or where you live before. This is the game being played in the charismatic church. You know why it is? Because there's no power left anymore because they're so immoral. See, the Holy Spirit anoints holiness. He doesn't anoint immorality and corruption and lying. Jesus speaking here, he said unto them, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. But... The fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Do you hear that? If you are a liar, a slanderer, a false witness, Bearing false witness, or not bearing false witness, it's one of the big ten, by the way. But he tells you here in the book of Revelation, this is your end if this is the kind of person you are. Some politicians on their way to hell. They're, oh, yeah, they laugh. Like it's, uh, well, I'm a politician, I'm supposed to lie. Well, guess what? <laughs> you know what's a breath of fresh air? is somebody in politics that tells the truth, even if it costs them an election. Tell the truth. How about that? Novel idea. Let's tell the truth. How many lives would have been saved if more people would have told the truth about, you know, that jibbity thing? Cancer rates are up. Death rates are up. It's all coming out now, but we all knew it back then. We all knew exactly what was going to happen. Yeah, we're, we, we, we got a new gibbity that's going to help you. Yeah, okay. Okay. Gibbity, huh? Yeah, help you, help you, help you help me, 
right? Get rid of you so there's more for me, right? I just saw a girl, young girl, just stroked out. It's not normal for young people to have strokes. It's not normal for young men to have heart attacks. Lies, lies, lies. This is why, listen, lies always are, it's hiding something. Some sin, some evil, some wickedness that's going to do more harm. And listen, if there's a lie, the only reason a person lies or a government lies or an institution lies, the only reason there are lies is to hide something. It's always to hide something. Because if you knew the truth, you wouldn't take the gibbity, you wouldn't buy the product, you wouldn't go to the church, you wouldn't do this or do that, so they can't tell you. But as Christians, folks, we have to be about the truth. We can't be lying about anything to anybody. And see, there's not going to be blood on my hands because I'm telling you, if you're a habitual liar, you will not go to heaven when you die. You will not have eternal life with Jesus Christ. This is crystal clear. Liars do not go to heaven. Because who's the liar? Satan, right? And I've said this many times. You're going to end up in the place of the one you act like and the one you follow. So you best be acting like Jesus. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, when he called his, he called Nathaniel, one of the beautiful things he said about Nathaniel his disciple, he said, there's no guile in him. There's no deceit. There's no falsehood. There's no lying in him. I believe that's why the Lord picked him. Because he was a, he was genuine. The Lord said, I saw you under the fig tree. There's no guile in you. And he's like, how do you know me? See, that's another thing. The Lord knows you. You might Fool everybody else. Might fool me. It's hard to fool me, but you might fool me. Because I'm not perfect. I might miss it. And you might fool me. But you're not fooling the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows your heart. He knows everything you've thought, every word you've spoken. And you know, the Bible says that we're going to be judged by every idle word that has come out of our mouth. So let me tell you, those words that come out of your mouth better be truth. Children, don't lie to your parents. Don't lie. I know foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child and it's natural to lie. Don't lie. Start breaking that habit now. You know, I have four rules when I had my, my kids coming up. And these four rules were simple. Rule number one, and these, if you broke these rules, automatic spanking. And when I spanked, it hurt, right? Automatic spanking and possible grounding as well. But it, any disobedience after you've been warned. I give you one warning. If I go clean up your room and as you still playing, I told you to go clean up your room. That's your warning. You got your chance. You were told once you didn't do it. You got a warning. After that, if I saw you not doing it, your butt was lit up. Number two was any disrespectful tone or words out of your mouth toward me or your mother. That comes out, belt comes out, paddle comes out, something's coming out. We're going out to the woodshed. Number three was if you lie to me. If you broke the lamp, you best confess. You will get more mercy telling me the truth than you will if you lie to me. I catch you lying to me, it's going to be a bad day for you. And then I told him, if you hit your, and I always had girls, I didn't have any boys, so if you hit your sister, I hit you. Real easy, right? 
And you know what? I did never wavered on those rules. And by the time they got about eight, nine years old, they knew, really? Like, are we, do we have to do this? And you see them start scooting like that. <laughs> Y'all know that's that scoot, right? But the lying issue is serious. God is serious about lying and the truth. Let's read. I love this right here. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Start at verse 1. Give you some New Testament. Then we're going back to some Old Testament. Now he's speaking to Christians here. Born again Christians. It should should be living different. We shouldn't be living according to the old man, the old ways, the old life. We should be living a new life through the power of Jesus and his Holy Spirit living in us. We should, we should be different than the world. But see, a lot of us still let the old man rise up and rule us. We let the flesh rule us and, it's, and we become carnal. You cannot. The carnal Man will lead you to death, and that death is the second death, eternally separated from God in hell forever. You cannot let the carnal man win this war. But he's in there. He's in all of us trying to make us do these things. But look at this. He says here, Colossians 3, he says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For we, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, that means to put to death. Therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in which ye also walked sometimes when you lived in them. But ye, now you put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Lie not. That's not a suggestion. It's a command. Do not lie to each other. Is that not clear? And why does he tell us this? He said, you are not supposed to be living like you did when you were unsaved. Back then, we told lies about stuff when it would have been easier to tell the truth. You know that you ever lie when you didn't even need to lie. It just was natural. It's like just flow. Especially when your parents caught you somewhere you shouldn't be or doing something you shouldn't be doing. Boy, you could come up with a story quick. Or the principal or the police officer. I've had all those conversations. I found the best thing with police officers, though. I just tell them the truth. Yes, I was speeding. I deserve a ticket. Go ahead and write it. And they'll go, hey, hey hold up. I'm not, I wasn't necessarily going to give you a ticket. <laughs> Truth will set you free. <laughs> I have been set free from many a ticket by just saying, yes, I did it, sir. Y'all have seen it. I don't argue. They saw me get pulled over twice in the same day in the same county, going to a campaign event and coming back. I don't know if the state troopers were worried I was going to be their next boss because they had Dino for governor on the truck, but I got warnings and I was flying down that mountain. I'm going to tell you that one on coming back home. But that's not my wife. No, I'm not the fast driver in the family. <laughs> I didn't grow up in Atlanta. Uh, lie not. Just tell the truth. Telling the truth is always better. You say, Pastor Dean, I don't think so sometimes. Yeah, it is. Let me show you. Let's go to uh, Psalm 63. I love this. 
Y'all don't mind if we go through a little bit of the Bible this morning, do you? Now, there's going to be a judgment upon liars. It's going to be bad. And the judgment will not just be when you die or when Jesus returns. The judgment can start here and now. And especially if you're slandering good people in public. You're slandering the righteous. You're slandering God's people in public. You best be careful. Better to keep your mouth shut than to go down that road. Here's what David said. I love this. And we're going to read the whole psalm. Here's only 11 verses, but it's just too good. Now, the reason, too, is my Bible, I hope your Bible has it in there, says this is a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Do you know why this is important? This is when he was being chased by Saul. His life was in danger every day. And Saul had told lies about him. Saul had made David out to be a criminal. Saul had convinced other soldiers that David used to know and command. He had convinced these soldiers, David is a criminal. Come with me to hunt him down and kill him. Now, you couldn't be in a more precarious situation than David was in because the little band he had with him was highly outnumbered by the Israeli army at the time. And King Saul was after him and he was in the wilderness. And he said this, he said, Oh God, thou art my God early or diligently, earnestly. Will I seek thee? My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. And he was out in this wilderness and in the desert and there was scarce water. But he says to see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. My mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Now think about this. He's in the wilderness, hiding, being hunted down. And he's saying, I will praise you, Lord. I will rejoice in you. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice, or in the shadow of thy wings I will rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth thee me but those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth well we just read that right he's saying this liar this person falsely accused me this person trying to kill me this person using their words against me well this is where they're going to go into the lower parts of the earth that's hell they shall fall by the sword which is interesting is a prophecy about what it did happen to saul and jonathan and he says, they shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. Ooh. See, we got some Saul Christians out there. You know what Saul Christians are? King Saul Christians. King Saul Christians started out right like Saul. Saul's heart was changed. He was humble. He was small in his own sight. So he had a humble attitude about himself. And when God decided to anoint him and make him king, and Samuel went to him and anointed him with home, it says Saul got a brand new heart, became like another man. Then the anointing of the Holy Spirit came on him when he got around the prophets and he started prophesying. They said, it's Saul among the prophets. So here Saul is blessed. God has lifted him up to be king of Israel, given him his Holy Spirit, the anointing. And then Saul begins to decide to do things his own way, not wait on Samuel. Saul wasn't a priest, but he, then he, did, he does a sacrifice. All this stuff starts happening, but here's what happens after that. When Samuel tells him the Lord's rejected you and has picked somebody else better than you, well, you don't want that to be said of you. Because here's what can happen to you, the deception that comes in. Because the Lord will allow the gifts, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, meaning the anointing and the gifts may stay there, may still operate in you. 
But then an evil spirit will come and operate through you too. And you'll start throwing javelins at the people of God. And one minute you're throwing javelins and trying to hurt God's called and chosen ones. And the next minute you're flowing in the gift. Yeah, Greg Locke. It's you. This is why he flows one minute in the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and the next minute he's slandering a brother and not even afraid to lie. Serious. Very serious. Go to Jeremiah chapter 9. I spent two days going through these scriptures on this. I really wasn't planning on it. I just started looking up lying. When you know, you start, there's a lot of variations of that. Lying, liars, tail bearers, backbiters, whisperers. Bearing false witness. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1. So what he says, now this is, Jeremiah was prophesying to the people of God. And he was prophesying about judgment that was about to come upon them. And they were oblivious to it. And didn't want to hear what he had to say about it. But he defines the problem in, among the people of God. Now this is not, again, this is the children of Israel. He's not talking to a forward nation. He's not talking to a heathen nation. And hear what he says here. He says, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them. For they be all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. And they bend their tongues like their bow for what? Lies. But they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust not in any brother. For every brother shall utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. Now let's put this up, slanders. Here's the Hebrew word for this. He's saying that this is the problem among the people of God. They just, all of them walk with these slanderers. And here it is. The word Rakil. Strong's here says a scandal monger. Right? Somebody just loves to cause them and speak them to slander, carry tales, a tale bearer. That's traveling about to carry tales. Oh boy, we got some of those, don't we? He goes on, verse 5 in Jeremiah, they will deceive everyone his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies and they weary themselves to commit iniquity. Thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit, and listen to this, deceit, which means falsehood, lies, they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I will melt them and try them. That means test them. For how shall I do for the daughter of my people? Their tongue is as an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. That's lies again. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he lieth his weight. Shall I not visit them for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on a nation as this? He's like, their whole, their, their whole habitation about where they live, and how, it's, it's all lies. I think about some of this stuff. I think about just the, the condition of most of the church in America. 
whether you talk about Baptist, Presbyterian, Charismatic, Pentecostal, most have made lies their refuge. Like, I'm once saved, always saved. No matter how I live, I'm eternally secure. There's nothing that can separate me from the love of God. I can be a homosexual. I can be a fornicator. I can be an adulterer. I can be, God still loves me and I'm on my way to heaven. That's a refuge of lies. Oh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, being led by the Holy Spirit, hearing the voice of God, being led by God. Oh, that's not for today. That all ended with the apostles. That's a refuge of lies. Oh, demons aren't active in North America like they teach at the Baptist Southwestern Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. They say demons aren't active in North America. Have you looked at Canada lately? <laughs> Trudeau, if no one in Canada has a demon, Trudeau has demons. No, demons are active all over the place and need to be bound and cast out and rebuked and resisted by true believers who have authority in Jesus Christ. But if you say that, no, no, no demons are operating. Y'all are a bunch of, y'all looking for a demon behind every bush. They're not behind bushes. No, they're in your house. They're trying to break up your marriage. They're in your head. They're in your heart. They're in your car with you, talking in your ear. No, they don't hide behind bushes. Because most of you don't have enough anointing to make them scared enough to go hide behind a bush. Because you like them. They're your friends. I'm, I'm not kidding. Some people are more used to their demons than they are the Holy Spirit. And I'm talking about Christians. Because I've spent the last 36, going on 37 years, casting demons out of Christians. I like Keith Green used to say that his ministry was to get Christians saved. Because the church world is a refuge of lies. It's one false doctrine after another, after another, after another. And so many people have made that their home, their habitation. That's where they live. Lies, lies, more lies piled on top, top of lies. And then there's the new ones like Jesus already came and the millennial reign already happened. That's just another lie. There, the lies are abundant. You have to remember, we just read a minute ago, he said these, they're not valiant for the truth. You know, it takes bravery, courage, boldness, strength to be for the truth in a time of unbelievable, just mountain of lies that are everywhere. And in that, I, I'm, it blows my mind. That really we only have one thing we can know as Christians that we know for sure is the truth. And that is the God-breathed, God-inspired, holy Word of God. And yet many won't even read it or they pick up a corrupted version of it like the message and think that's the Bible. That's another refuge of lies. Are you valiant for the truth? Do you tell the truth? Do you speak the truth? See, some people lie because they just don't want the pressure. They don't want the persecution. They don't want the attacks, the resistance. They don't want to lose friends. They don't want to lose relationships. So you lie. And let me tell you, even if it's a little white lie, like, you know, your wife makes the worst meatloaf you ever had in your life. If you don't tell the truth about that, you're going to be eating that meatloaf for many years to come. Oh, it's great, honey. Oh, she's going to make it again. <laughs> tell the truth. I tell my wife the truth. She cooks good stuff. She's had some stuff. She bombed on. I just tell the truth. Oh, mm -mm, that wasn't too good. Tell the truth. I can't remember. There was some preacher I remember years ago talking about he went and visited a house. And 
I think I can't remember. I think it was down in Louisiana, and they were cooking gumbo. Now, I love gumbo, good real gumbo. And said, you know, this guy that never went to church and wasn't saved, and said his wife made the worst gumbo ever in the world. And the preacher came in and ate some of that gumbo and was like, mm, this is terrible. And then she asked how it was, and he was like, and the Lord said, don't you lie. Don't you lie. Don't you lie to her. And he goes, it's, it's crap. And the man stood up and said, you're the first preacher that ever told the truth. <laughs> and the man got saved. Uh -huh. We think it's not important, but just think about that. He could have just said, oh, it's wonderful. And he's never going to be there again. But he told the truth. And that man said, somebody told her the truth. You're the first preacher ever sat in this house and told her the truth. It's important to tell the truth. It sets people free. Amen? Y'all won't mind this, do you? Think about our world if everybody in our world told the truth. Say, so, well, that, we, we, we run around, a lot of people get their feelings hurt. But let me tell you what we'd have. We'd have a lot more real relationships. We've just be honest with each other. You know, there are some folks out there that think they can sing and they cannot sing. Somebody has to tell them. For the rest of us. It's amazing, though. You know, I remember years ago watching some American Idol when my daughters wanted to watch it. And I'd see these people who truly deep down believed that what was coming out of it was beautiful. And you're just like, the dogs are howling and it's hurting your ears. <laughs> and those judges would tell them the truth. I'm sorry. You're not a singer. But my mama said I was. Your mama lied to you. <laughs> you need to go into something else other than singing. See, and if we lie, think about parents, if we lie to our kids about their gifts and talents and don't tell them the truth, it may send them down a road they don't need to go. They're, they're, they, it will cause them to be unsuccessful. You need to tell them the truth. If they stink at singing, give up trying to be a singer. I know one of Nancy's brothers, oh, he wanted to play basketball. Wanted to play basketball. Just, oh, the basketball coach finally told him, said, son, I just got to tell you, you're terrible. You're terrible at basketball. You need to put your energy and time in something you're good at. And he did that. And he became successful in the thing he did. I know a guy that played football for Auburn many years ago, played for uh, Pat Dye. And he's a big guy, big lineman, offensive lineman. Uh, here from here in Alabama, he passed away. He was a good guy, Sprayberry, Tim Sprayberry. And he told me this story. He said, you know, he said, I was working hard. I wanted to I wanted to play. I wanted to become a starter, and I was just working hard. I was working hard in the weight room. I was working hard. And he said, finally, Pat Dye called me in his office one day, and he just said, son, I love your heart. I love your work ethic. I love how uh, you're, you're on time every day, and you give it your all. He said, but you're not going to play for me. He said, you're not big enough. You're not strong enough. You're not fast enough. And I just don't want you to waste your time because you could be doing something else. And uh, he said, I'll let you stay if you want to stay and, and continue to practice and help the team, he said, but you're not going to play. And he was honest with it. And he said he appreciated that because he went into what he needed to go into. Just tell him the truth. Say, well, I, I don't want to hurt people's feelings. Ugh. But sometimes that's what they need to get them on the right path. See, I hurt somebody's feelings nearly every week. <laughs> it's part of my job. But it's not because I, I hate people. It's not because I don't love people. It's not. I want people to grow. I want people to find their gifts and callings in God. I want them to find their own relationship with Jesus and, and, and hear from the Holy Spirit and do what he wants you to do for your life. That's all I want. 
I, I, that's why I don't tell people, yeah, you got to come to our church. I, I Come to our church if the Lord tells you to come to our church. That's what I do. Because I don't want you to come here if you're not supposed to be here. I want the will of God for your life because I know what that's going to be what's best for you. And I remember the years ago, I remember telling somebody, there was somebody that, oh, they wanted to be a preacher, but they could not preach at all. It was painful to listen to. But they did have gifts and talents in other areas to help a ministry. And I remember telling them, I'm sorry, you're a horrible public speaker. You can't do it. You just, there's no anointing and no gift there. But that's okay because God doesn't call us all to do that. And that's okay. You got to find what God wants you to do. And it ain't standing up here preaching. Because that just torture everybody. <laughs> and I told them. The Lord made me tell them the truth. I fired somebody one time. And I said, you're going to be mad at me now. I said, but... You, I know the Lord wants you out of the nest because you're going to find your own gifts and your own calling and your own ministry and one day you'll, you'll love me again because you'll see it. Oh, they're mad at me. Oh, they left mad, mad. But it's happened. It made them seek the Lord, find what he called them to do. And they've called me and apologized and we're friends and we're going to help them do what they're called to do and if i hadn't have pushed them out of the nest things would have things would have went bad for them and us because it needed to happen and some of you need to get honest with some children some grown children there's some people listen and may I, this is for somebody i feel this very strongly stop enabling your drug addict children you make the ultimatum you get no more money no more assistance from me until you, you, you go get in a rehab if you got to get in a rehab whatever you got to do but i'm not helping you anymore and somebody need to hear it you need to stop they're draining you financially spiritually mentally emotionally it's time you make them grow up and if they, if they end up out on the street, maybe living under the bridge will wake them up that maybe they want something better out of life. I've had some people end up under the bridge or end up in prison, and they finally woke up and said, you know what, I'm going to do what's necessary to get this addiction broken and off of the drugs or the alcohol, and I'm going to change my life. And they've changed their lives for be the better, but they had to be allowed to hit rock bottom and if mom and daddy keep catching them and facilitating and helping them out they're going to stay a drug addict they're going to stay in that life so that's mean pastor dean no it's truth truth hurts sometimes truth is painful but it must be told and it must be walked out I mean, even here, we have people all the time. We, we help people that have needs. We help people in this church all the time. We help people that come in off the street with stuff. But I'm not handing money to them to go down to the liquor store. You understand? Or go, go to the drug house and buy drugs. If I, if I feel like they're still on drugs and they're still drinking, like I smell it on one individual that pops in here from time to time, I told him the other day, you're not getting any cash. Do you need something to eat? We'll get somebody to take you down to one of them and get you something to eat. We don't mind getting you some food to eat, but I'm not giving you money to go buy liquor or drugs. It's not happening. Told him, I said, I smell it on you. Oh, no, I don't drink. I ain't been I smell it. <laughs> These people forget that I wasn't always a Christian. I know what every type of alcohol smells like. I remember... When we started the school, the, the school, the high school, you know, in, in Montgomery, I remember, you know, it was, it was junior high and high school kids, and we had a room full about like this, but there were a little few more, and there were tables. They were at round tables. And I taught the Bible class, and I taught the origins of civil government. 
right, to the high school. So I taught two classes in that school, it was a Christian school. And I remember walking around, giving them their little Bible devotion one morning. I walked around here, and then I, I walked over here, and I said, you know what's funny? I got over here to this table. It was about, always about nine, ten people around the table. I said, when I get at this table, I smell marijuana. I said, well, when I walk over here, I don't. And I said, wait a minute. Let me come back over here. Yes, I smell marijuana right here. You should have seen him up. <laughs> like, how does he know? You can smell it, y'all. People act like they can hide smoking cigarettes, too. That's funny. You're not hiding it. I said, y'all better confess. I said, because the next, the next phone calls to the police. So if, but if you confess what you've done, we'll sit down in the office and talk about it, and you might get some mercy. But if you lie, I'm just going to call the police because you can't be bringing dope on a campus with kids from kindergarten on up. You just can't do it. Guess what? They all went to the office and confessed, and we had a little conversation. My nose knows. <laughs> but tell the truth. See, the truth, I used to have a deal with my kids, too. It was always better to tell me the truth because I'm all about, I'll give you mercy. What is mercy? When you deserve punishment, but I choose in my good and sweet heart to not give it to you. That's mercy. You deserve it, but you're not going to get it because I'm letting you off this time. And you know what that teaches them? It teaches them God's nature. He's a God of justice, but he's also a God of mercy. If you humble yourself and confess and admit the truth and tell the truth and tell the truth about your own heart. Look, getting saved or getting out of sin or out of the pig pen. If you're a backslidden Christian, you've gone back to the pig pen. The first they'll tell you it doesn't matter what you're into. The first step is admitting what you are and what you were doing. If you can admit, I'm a sinner, I'm lost, I let myself be deceived, I let my flesh take over, and I am just indulging evil and wickedness, I am sinning against heaven, I'm sinning against the Lord, I need His forgiveness, I hope He will forgive me. You have a humble heart and you go to God and say, I need your forgiveness, I repent of this, I don't want to live this way anymore. You're, you're telling the truth to God. And when you do that, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you and to give you another opportunity. That's the beautiful thing about the gospel and Jesus dying for our sins. And what he has provided through that is, man, we can completely blow it. And he can restore us and have mercy on us but we got to be honest if you're an adulterer you say you know what adultery is a sin unto death will put me in hell i'm going to stop this adulterous affair and repent and seek the lord for forgiveness and restoration see so many people they lie to themselves you know you know what you want to tell you a lie to the devil that you believe a lie to yourself it's not that bad god understands you start hearing those things in your head. Let me tell you what that is. The liar. Let's do this real quick because it's just a little after 12. Just a little after. But I got to read a few of these verses. These are in Proverbs. Y'all ready to do a, a, a little race through Proverbs? Chapter 6, starting at verse 16. I'm going to read a few. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. That means that abomination is something he really hates. A proud look, a lying tongue. Do you see that? Everybody see that? A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. God says he hates these things. And twice in there he says lying. Lying. Let's go to Proverbs 10:18. We're going to do a look. Come on, we're going to do it quick. Proverbs only right now. 
Proverbs 10, 18 says, He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. So I don't have to call you a fool. The Bible will call you a fool if you're doing foolish stuff. All right? But notice he says, He that hideth hatred with lying lips. See, here's the thing. You're going to see there's another verse right here. In fact, jump to Proverbs 26, 28. Because these two go together. Remember 10 to 18 there says, He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. And then he says this in Proverbs 26, 28, A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. So he says that hatred is really what's behind lying. Oh. You say, Pastor Dean, now wait a minute now. If I lie about somebody, slander somebody, I'm not, I don't hate them. Oh, yes, you are, because you are doing harm to them. You're doing harm, and especially, okay, for instance, somebody tries to turn people against me, and I'm trying to lead those people to Jesus, and they might have needed to hear what I have to say, so they might be saved, and you got somebody out there slandering me, so they're going to interfere with that person listening to what they might need to hear from me. It's, it's the same. It works for everybody that way. But deep down, if you're willing to, to lie, slander, bear false witness, you are really destroying somebody's uh, ability to do what God's called them to do or to help the people they're supposed to help. So it's really a chain reaction. This is why it's hatching snake eggs. Because let me tell you, these little vipers, they're able to kill you. It's about the pr producing death, spiritual death. There's been people that have been turned away from our ministry that needed our ministry because of the mouths of people. And I'm not saying we're the only ministry. There's other ministries out there that people needed to get to, and they got slandered by somebody, and those people said, no, I'm not going to that one either. But notice he talked about hatred being connected to lying. I find that very interesting. When it talks about slander there in Proverbs 10, 18, the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon says slander is whispering, defamation, an evil report that glides stealthily. Oh, this is what happens in church last time. Negativity starts floating st stealthily through you know what it just starts happening in our church a lot of people let me just tell you something i need to get this out because i know there's been attitudes and things said against my wife and negativity folks i'm gonna tell you right now there ain't a person that loves this church body and is willing to do whatever is necessary to help you and to help this church that my wife, she does more than I do. She's a better, she's really the pastor heart. I'm just the preacher. Okay. And I want to tell you right now, the devil comes, and we've had people actually come in and try to sow division between me and my own wife, try to be negative about her to me. We had one crazy woman coming in saying I should, I should divorce my wife. I looked at her like, yeah, I know you're a witch now. I mean, we've had some psycho stuff going, but what bothers me is not that. It's just when the negativity starts swimming stealthily through our own church. And for some reason, you ladies are worse than men about this stuff. I'm just going to be honest with you. You are. Men, for the most part, we don't care. <laughs> Y'all get to talking, and next thing you know, ooh, this one did this one, this one did Oh, you know she did that. You know she, you know she said that. You know she looked at me this way. And then it passes down. And us men are like, what are y'all talking about? <laughs> don't get me wrong. There's some men that get involved in it too sometimes. But you hear what I'm saying? It can start real stealthily. I like that word. 
The word defamation, because it's in this definition here, the definition of defamation is the act of communicating false statements about a person that injure the reputation of that person. Did y'all hear that? So slander is the act of communicating false statements about a person that injure the reputation of that person. This is serious stuff. Go to Proverbs 12, 17. We're coming in for a landing. Proverbs 12, 17. Then we're going to go to verse same chapter, verses 19 and 20 and verse 22. We'll go through them quickly. It says, He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. Verse 19. The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. That's why God's going to deal with it. Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but to the counselors of peace is joy. Verse 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. Whew. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. He hates it. He de the word abomination means not just he hates, he detests it. Do you understand? Young people, children, y'all hear me? God detests, he despises, he hates it when you lie. But it goes for mom and dad too. God, he, and let me tell you, when the Lord hates something and you do it, it's making him angry. Just go on it. It will make him start getting angry. This you don't want. I know one of the things, you read through the book of Judges, and when the Israelites would get on God's bad side, it would say, and the anger of the Lord waxed hot against Israel. Guess what? I don't want that. Let's keep going. These are, these, Proverbs 19, verse 5, verse 9, and verse 22. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. You hear that? You want to guarantee the punishment of God in your life? Be a liar. Be a slander. Be a false witness. Verse 9. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. Think about that. That's two verses in the same chapter that say almost the same thing. Then verse 22, the desire of a man is his kindness, and a poor man is better than a liar. Ooh. Saying I'd rather take a homeless man than a dressed up liar. Proverbs 21, 6 and verse 28. The getting of treasure by a lying tongue is a vanity tossed to and fro of them that seek death. I think about these ministries. Oh, a thousand dollar seed for a prophecy. A thousand dollar seed and you'll get your miracle. Ooh, we better give. Better give to our ministry. If you, if you give to our ministry, you'll get deliverance. Well, that's what, that's the new one some of them are doing. That's what that Catherine Crick is doing. I saw the video. If you come give, you'll get your deliverance. God, that makes me sick. But think about it. Getting, the getting of treasures by a lying tongue is vanity tossed to and fro of them that seek death. Verse 28, 21, that's 21, 6. Verse 28, a false witness shall perish. But a man that heareth speaketh constantly. If you look that word up constantly in the Hebrew, it means a man that speaks uh, with a bright words, with a goal, that speaks truthfulness, um, and that, that constantly speaks with strength and victory. So he's, he's, it's, King James is a little vague there. You have to look up the Hebrew word. It's not incorrect, but it's just, vague but he's talking about a false witness shall perish but a man that heareth and heareth speaketh uh, with victory and truthfulness and strength 
See, that's another thing. I, I, I get accused of being prideful because I speak with strength. And a lot of people, somebody even said on one of the comments the other day, be careful, Pastor Dean, you say I too much. <laughs> okay, here's the thing. I don't care if it's Paul or Peter or James or John. When they were telling stories about what God did, they had to say, I did this and I did that. And we went there and we did this. It's not her crime, y'all, okay? Because let me just go ahead and inform you in case you don't know. I don't believe I can do anything in my own strength of power for God. Because if I do, it's emptiness. I can tell you right now that I wouldn't even be here today if God had not intervened in my life again and again and again. So I don't think I'm anything. I know it's been the grace and mercy and power and protection and deliverance of God. Even at times when I know I didn't deserve it. When I was in a bad place with a bad attitude. And God still was loving me and helping me through that time period. So I don't think I'm anything, y'all. But if God does something in my life, if I pray for somebody and God heals them, or if I cast the demons out of somebody, guess what? I'm going to say, I cast the demons out of Maggie. Yes, I did. And I'm not ashamed of that. But it's by the power and authority of Jesus Christ. It's by his anointing. It's what he has given me. I have nothing of my own. Amen. Uh, I wonder how these people talk without using I. I'd like to hear those conversations. <laughs> yeah. Me. Huh? Someone said me. Y'all ready? Two, two, three more. Proverbs 21, 28 in the Amplified. A false witness will perish, but a man who listens to the truth will speak forever and go unchallenged. Proverbs 21, 28 in the complete Jewish Bible. I love it. A lying witness is doomed. But one who heard what was said will testify successfully. Folks, it could go on and on and on. We are called to be people who are speaking truth and not lies. So if you've got a problem with lying, you need to confess it as sin and repent of it and stop it. If you've been a false accuser or jumping to conclusions about people and situations, or passing on rumors that can't be verified. You know, when I was in Tennessee, leading up to the debate, right before we went to Tennessee, I had people giving me information, people who said they were in Greg Locke's church, who worked for him. I have inf things that they told me that were going on. Do you know why I don't say anything? I have never said anything because I didn't see it myself. Do you know how many people would take something like that and just pass on stuff? One of the reasons I separated myself from Tim Greer is because he was slandering Greg Locke and saying things about him and his family that could not be verified, were rumors. You don't do that to somebody. Those things could be complete fabrications. Somebody right now could just go out and make up something about me. This is why the Bible says, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Meaning, you better have some eyewitnesses of the situation. And if you're not an eyewitness, you probably don't need to be talking. And if you are an eyewitness and it's a minister of the gospel, then you need to go to the proper people around him to talk to them or go to him first. At least. In fact, the Bible says if you've got a problem with somebody, you've got an issue, they've trespassed against you or they've offended you in some way, you're supposed to go talk to them first. It doesn't matter if they're famous. It doesn't matter if they thousands of people around them. You're supposed to go to them. And a lot of this stuff can be handled, but don't, you know, oh, I heard, you know what I heard about so-and-so? Well, really, who, how do you know that's true? That's the first question you said. Should I, how do I know what they're telling me? 
is truth. And even though, let's say they're convinced it's truth, but how do they know the person who told them told the truth? Do you know witches and Satanists come in churches and pretend to be Christians? And one of the ways they start division and divide church is to start spreading rumors about people in the church and particularly leadership. And they start sowing those things. And because Christians won't get control of their mouths and stop spreading slander and lies, it ends up tearing up the whole church. That's why I kicked one out not too long ago when I found out she was going around to different people and telling little lies and making little negative comments and trying to sow division between our church family and me and my wife as the pastors. And I was like, time for you to pack your bags, sweetie pie, and move on out the door because you're causing division. I've marked you. Bye-bye. It's time to go. The church is supposed to be what? What did, what, did, what did the Bible call the church? The apostles called it the pillar and ground of the truth. We're supposed to be ground zero of nothing but truth. The name for the whole, one of the names for the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of even the spirit of truth, just the spirit of truth. We want him. On our lives, we want him working through us. We want him flowing through us. We want his power, his anointing, his gifts. If he's the spirit of truth, we better be about the truth. 100%. And how many things could be avoided when we start struggling with something? Maybe we're struggling with a sin. Maybe we're starting to fall. Maybe we're starting to feel overwhelmed by some temptation. And you know what? The Bible says to do your says you're supposed to go confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed, that you may be delivered. How many people would have not completely fallen into some big, huge, scandalous mess if when they started struggling would have went and told somebody the truth? Hey, man, I'm struggling. Pray for me. So many people just hide it and try to cover it up and try to say, I'll just do it myself. And they end up falling apart. And things get worse. I know it. I, it look, if, if, if alcoholics and drug addicts, the first thing that they have to do is admit the truth. They've got to admit they're a drug addict. They've got to admit they need help. They've got to admit they're in a place where they can't do it themselves. If that's what they have to do, guess what? That's what all of us have to do with this issue of sin and temptation. You hear me? Let's stand. Remember our verse we started out with. Don't be hatching snake eggs. Here's the thing. You start hatching snake eggs. You know what it said right after that? Those who eat those eggs die. Because see, when you start hatching snake eggs, you start feeding them to other people. And the snakes start hatching out. You hear me? And then he says this. This is something else. You start hatching snake eggs and he says, here's what happens. He says, you crush them. You try to crush them. Somebody comes along like like me, like you, you, you start making your life a refuge of lies in these snake eggs. And somebody like me comes, starts stomping on them. It says they break out into vipers. That's why people get mad. You start stomping on their on their lies that they believe and cling to. Oh, here come the snakes. See, you find it interesting. Jesus called the Pharisees a generation of vipers. Because he said, out of your heart comes these evil things you say and teach. So he was literally telling them, you guys are hatching snake eggs. You guys are spewing things that should not be spewed out. What were they? They were going around saying, what? Jesus broke the Sabbath. Jesus blasphemed. And here they're talking about the one who never sinned. You want to talk about slander. You want to talk about lying. You want to talk about falsehood. They even lied to you. Even when Jesus told them and said, you guys are seeking to kill me. And they go, "What? You're, you're crazy. Nobody's seeking to kill you. And they start lying immediately. You generation of vipers. And then he tells them, he, twice he says it. One time he says it about what's coming out of the mouth. The next time he says it, he says, you generation of vipers, how will you escape the damnation of hell? 
Because what their problem was, they were lying, false teachers, false accusers. And it was their hatred and jealousy because of the anointing and power on Jesus' life. They couldn't do what he did. They couldn't teach like he teach. And instead of humbling themselves, their jealousy, their religious pride caused them to become liars, false accusers. And the Lord tells them, how shall you escape the damnation of hell? You are a bunch of vipers and you're laying eggs. Ain't nothing. Listen, y'all ever been around a snake? Ever been to a snake den? You know, if you crawled into a cave at night, you know, say you got in, the, you know, you're in the desert, you're in the wilderness somewhere. And you thought, oh, I found me a nice little cave. And you crawl in it and you smell a stench. I'll tell you what it is. It's a snake den because they stink. I, I've, I've smelled, I've smelled rattlesnake den. Oh, it's terrible. They're hatching those eggs and just, it's just, how to put it, there ain't nothing clean about a bunch of snakes hatching and a snake den. It's nasty. It's dangerous. So you should want to have nothing to do with this snake egg business, right? So just think about it this way. Every time you want to start believing a lie, telling a lie, speaking a lie, telling a falsehood, spreading a rumor, slandering somebody, false accusing somebody that you don't have proof of something, you should start saying it. You're the snake. You're the one sowing the eggs out, putting the eggs out. Don't do it. Amen? Amen. We got a good song ready. Let's worship one more song. We're, oh. Hmm? Sure. Why not? Crushing snakes. I love my actually is one of my top three favorite songs. Right. Let's do that. We'll sing that and go out on a happy note. And y'all don't run out just yet after the song. I just got one more announcement and, and we can go out and cut off after that. Give him praise. Thank you, Jesus. We have power and authority through the blood of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus against all the forces of darkness. We thank you, Lord, for power and authority over it. And we don't have to be liars and we don't have to live in sin. We don't have to be rebel. We don't have to spread rumors and speak falsehood. We don't have to be false accusers. We don't have to align ourselves with the devil because of the blood of Jesus Christ and the power and authority he's given to us. We just have to apply it we have to exercise it amen let me tell y'all a funny story real quick we're in huntsville no huntsville no we're in birmingham and doing one of the first debates and it was actually we had like the six democrat candidates for governor and the five or six of us that were there as the republican candidates for governor and one of the questions at the end was what is your theme song of your campaign just, we had to write these things down, and I wrote Crushing Snakes and held it up. They were like, what is that? <laughs> I guarantee you every one of them went home and listened to it, didn't I? Hey, Amen. <laughs> God is good. Well, we'll say bye to those out there. Y'all hug some dicks out there before you leave and those here. Uh, but we got uh, just a quick announcement. Just let everybody know something real quick.